But you're here because there's some of you, I know you're, you're in missions. Uh, some of you have been pastors before and you've, now you're, you're, you're serving in different roles. Um, you're here because you love God. A few weeks ago as I began to think about what God would have me to give to you, uh, he put a message on my heart. One of the big words that um, he spoke to me was distracted. And as that word permeated in my spirit, I began to think about the church, think about the leadership of the church, think about you. And how that so many times the enemy tries to get us distracted. Now, distracted is interesting in the sense that it doesn't mean you're not moving forward, but you might not be moving forward at the rate that God wants you to. Distracted doesn't mean that you're not on the path, but it might mean that somewhere you've taken a siesta or two. Right? Distracted doesn't mean that you don't love God, but he doesn't have your full attention. And so, the person that came to mind, and we're going to talk about his life tonight, is Samson. And the title I gave for this message is Finding Your Strength Again. Amen. Finding Your Strength Again. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Zechariah chapter 4. I'm going to look at these two verses first. Verses 6 and 7. Zechariah was a prophet. He was a priest. Uh, he was instrumental in building the, the temple in Jerusalem. He took over 50,000 Jews out of uh, Babylon, out of bondage, and he took them back to Jerusalem. And with God's help, he rebuilt the temple. And these are some words that God had given to him to speak over Zerubbabel, um, the man that was kind of in charge of what was going on. It says this, then he said, and spanked to them, saying, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. R Zerubbabel, say that five times back. <laughs> saying, look at this, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. I want to just talk about that verse for a second before we move on. It's interesting that in the church world, we've switched that around. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We really have. Amen. Uh, if you're sitting here and you are, and if you've been in the ministry for any amount of time, you know that many times you're the one pulling double duty triple duty, quadruple duty. You're the one that when the project starts and when people bail out, you're the one that steps in and has to complete the project that you never want to be a part of in the first place. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. It's understanding that many times the word that is seen in the church is this, is it's not by my spirit, but it's by my strength. You follow me? We have good intentions, and we want God's Spirit to strengthen us, but sometimes God doesn't show up fast enough. Sometimes we have to get out and go and drain ourselves down to nothing. And so we find ourselves running on empty. We find ourselves not knowing what the step is, what, what, what things need to happen. Look at this next part to this verse. It says, Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone. What's it talking about? It's talking about God establishing and building his kingdom, or building his temple there in Jerusalem. The headstone with shouts and cries, grace unto it. Zerubbabel and Zechariah here began to speak of a word, of a truth that he understood very, very solemn. He knew that it wasn't by strength that things are accomplished, but it was by God's spirit yes. that it's accomplished. Amen. And as we look at our lives, I pray that tonight, as pointed as this message is going to get, I promise, that you can evaluate your spirit and look deep within your heart because there are some of us today that we carry a very heavy weight. We hide it from a lot of people. 
And there are a lot of things that are going on in the background that nobody sees. We've done a very good job at, at, at hiding these things. And I want to say to you that this is your night. This is your day for God to help you, for God to uplift you, for God to strengthen you in the way that only he can. Yes. You know, as we look and we move into this, it's interesting that we kind of switch gears and we think about Samson. Samson was interesting to me as I, I've studied him out a little bit and looked at some of his life. It, it's interesting that from his birth, he had a mandate upon his life that he was going to be a deliverer for Israel. He, he, before he was ever born, God knew what he was going to become, and, and he put in place the things that would become and what would go forth, and that Samson himself would be a deliverer for Israel, that he would, he would wipe out or begin to wipe away the Philistines, the, the enemy of God's people, and he would do it through ways and things that, that we could not have imagined. It says this in Judges chapter 13, verse number 1. Judges chapter 13, verse number 1. It says, And the people of Israel did again, uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Sometimes within our lives, we wonder why we're walking the way we're walking. And we wonder why we're at the place that we're at. Could it be that maybe we've turned our back on God somewhere? Could it be, I know we're good Christians and, and God loves us, but could it be that somewhere along the line we have set up some gods or some idols in the place of the Lord? Could it be that somewhere along the line we are reaping the fruit or the seed of what we have sown and the things that are coming back into our lives are just a product of the lifestyle that is going on that maybe nobody sees? I can already hear some of you will. That's what grace is for. You're very true. God, thank God for his grace. And Tony talked about that. But that doesn't mean that there's not a price that has to be paid. That's right. Amen. It's interesting that we talk about the life of, of uh, Samson. That God used him in such miraculous ways. He was called and commissioned. It says there in Judges chapter 13 verses 3 through 5. I'm not going to take the time to read all these scriptures. But it says that he began and God spoke to him that he would save Israel from the hands of of the Philistines. Samson had a mandate. He had a call. There was uh, something, an anointing that was placed upon his life that was very significant and very peculiar and very special. And those of us that sit here tonight, you are the same way. God has placed his spirit on you. God has put his spirit within you. God has called those that are pastors and leaders in this place tonight. You're not there because you just happen to show up. You're there because God has placed you there. He has anointed you for that position. He has put you there for his purpose and his plan. And I will say to you this, this evening is that the devil would do everything in his power to strip away the calling on your life. The devil would do everything in his power to cause you to step away from what God's called you to do. The devil would do everything in his power to chain you up and to make you lose vision of where God has called you to go. Amen. Well, I'm preaching better than you're amen in this evening. <laughs> Glory to God. It's interesting. We look at uh, Samson, that we see that he had a Nazarite vow. Now, that's a very peculiar thing. We don't hear about that a lot. But what's interesting is I studied this. His mom actually had to participate in this vow, too, because she couldn't yeah. drink any alcohol, and she had to live a life above yeah. reproach. But it said that Samson, according to this vow, this commitment that he had to God, that he was unable and should not drink alcohol. He could not touch any dead thing or eat any any unclean food, and then he could not cut his hair. Now, those are all the stipulations, if we could. Those are like the Ten Commandments that you and I should be following. Amen. Amen. And the Word of God, the thou shalt not, that we should be following in our lives. But you see, the thou shalt not and the commandments that God lays before us is not set because God has a do and a don't list. What the true essence of what God has put in place is this, is that God doesn't want us to follow Him because we have to. God wants us to follow Him because we want to. Amen. God wants our hearts. He doesn't want us just to fall in line because we're afraid of what might happen. He's looking for a people that have a consecrated heart. He's looking for a people that desire to serve Him above all things, that there's nothing that has been set up above Him. Amen. Amen. And somewhere along the line, it says that Samson lost sight of this. It's interesting when you look at his life, and boy, Samson, got, he's got quite the resume. I'll tell you, boy, if we could do half the things that he did, we would think we were something big. 
It said that Samson, when he was going to his own wedding, that somewhere along the way a lion approached him and he killed the lion with his bare hands. I don't know about you, that's pretty intimidating. The very idea that a man could, could, could kill a lion with his bare hands, I'll tell you, that's a real man if you ask me. But you go on to say that at his wedding, and he goes on and then, it, and then he kills 30 Philistines. He goes on to say that he gathers 300 uh, foxes and ties their tails together. And I'm just giving you again a breakdown of some of the highlights of his life. You can redo it on your own, but he ties these 300 foxes together and lights them on fire and sends them into the fields of the Philistines to burn up their harvest. He does these things. He goes on in the Bible says that he kills a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. He goes on to take the, the gates of Gaza and he pulls these gates off their hinges and takes them to the top of a hill. I'm talking about a man with immense strength. A man, the Bible says, that ruled as a judge over Israel for over 20 years. If anybody knew what it was like to be a part of ministry, he did. If anybody knew what it was like to face the pressures of, of life and the trials that come from churches, he did. And yet he found himself in the lap of Delilah, giving away the, what he thought to be the secret to his strength. He became distracted in his walk. He became distracted. It's interesting that it just happens so quickly sometimes. It, somewhere we, we go from, we can't do without God's presence that we can learn how to get up and preach a sermon because we just know how to do it. We can put our three points together and, and we can tell a few stories and have our illustration and an altar call and boy, we're good. Why? Because... We know how to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trained to do. Yeah. We have experience. But you see the fervency and the passion. Somewhere along the way. It falls by the wayside. And it's not that God has abandoned us. But somewhere something has grabbed our attention. And it draws us off course. And we, we just keep stepping forward. Because that's all we knew to do. And, and we got to keep moving forward. And the church has to have somebody. And for well, we've got to fill the spot. But we've become distracted. Somewhere along the way we find ourselves. Let me get this water before I burn up up here. Amen. Take that coat off. <laughs> Amen. You, you okay with that? I don't want to offend anybody. Yes, sir. We come out here with the real people. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit that saith the Lord. Yes. Number one, that's my opening. Amen. I promise Amen. you we'll get done by 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, getting lost in life. You've got to find your strength. Again, because somewhere you lost it. And you, you know it. I mean, you can play the game, but you know it. Getting lost in life is so easy to do. You know, Samson had a great start. I mean... Man, he had a great start. The Bible says in Judges chapter 13, verses 24 and 25, it says, And the woman bore a son, and they called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon, uh, began to stir, uh, stir in him. It's interesting that God's presence and God's power was upon him 
at such a young age that he understood what it was like to walk in the anointing of God. I, I mean, I look back at my life. I got saved in the youth camp. I was a young man when I gave myself to the Lord. Today I'm only 35. But but I mean, uh, but somewhere along the way, somebody caught that. Amen. I'm not 35. I'm a few years older than that. Not as old as Tony, though. But but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's 49. I mean, come on. <laughs> but you see, getting lost in life means that somehow you were driven more by what you saw than what you felt in your heart. Mm. Getting lost in life means that somewhere along the way you were more driven by what you felt and the pleasure you could receive instead of walking in faith and sacrificing. Whoever said that sacrificing was easy was a liar. <laughs> it's not. Whoever said that, that sin for a season isn't pleasurable is a liar. Because it is pleasurable for a season, but then it comes to reap its harvest from your life. It says this in Judges chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, if you would look with me. And he came up, this is a, Samson speaking to his parents, and told his father and mother, and he said, I have seen a woman in Timoth, the daughter of what? The Philistines. Now therefore, get her for my wife, or get her for me to be my wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of your brethren among my people, that thou shalt take as a wife an uncircumcised Philistine. Look at this. And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me. Look at this. For she pleases me well. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to the humility? What happened to the consecrated heart? What happened to the dedication to God? Right. Somewhere along the way, his eyes began to shift. Somewhere along the way, his gaze began to look over a little bit further into the neighbor's yard. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Somewhere along the way, he lost sight of what God was calling him to. And what happened is he began to get conquered by the things that he should have been conquering. All of a sudden, he began to get conquered by lust. The lust of the flesh. All of a sudden, the lustful appetites of the world began to cloud his judgments. And he found himself walking in things and doing things that were not part of what God had called him to do. What am I talking about? I'm talking about learning to gain inside of what God's trying to do. I'm talking about the idea that somewhere along the way we get lost in life. He is testing the boundaries. He goes on to say in Judges chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. I'm not going to take the time to read it. But it says he comes upon this lion that he had just defeated and, and killed some time back. And it now has a, a honey barrel, if I could use those terms, in the midst of the carcass. Well, you know that Samson's supposed to be following a Nazarite vow. That means he can't touch any dead thing. But it, it looked so good and it tastes so good and it smelled so good. And what happened was he found himself doing the thing that he should not have been doing, touching the thing that he should not have been touching, involving himself in the thing that he should not have been involved in. Why? Because somewhere along the way, he got drawn off course and his eyes got off of the thing that he should have not been looking at. He began to test his boundaries. He began to see, well, if I do this, what will happen? Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm, maybe you're just too sanctified for me tonight. I, I'm, I want you to be real and look at your life this, this evening. That somewhere along the way, we do the same thing. We see how far we can go. We see what we can do that nobody knows about. We touch the thing that sometimes we shouldn't be touching. Yeah. We got the grace of God. We got the love of God. But friend, get this. Sin will always have a price to pay. Yeah. You might be hiding it from all of us, but somewhere the reaper is going to show up and he's going to de demand a payment from you yeah. and you won't have enough to pay. Amen. It's testing the boundaries. He found himself out of control. You ever find yourself in a skid 
and you just had to take it along for the ride in the ice or the snow. I turned a few corners too fast in the ice and the snow. I've got a Jeep Cherokee and it's got four wheel drive, all wheel drive, it's got these big knobby tires. I just love it because I think I can go anywhere. <laughs> Sometimes I get humbled because I'll all of a sudden find myself sliding in a direction that I did not want to go, but all of a sudden I'm at the whim of what I was involved in. Come on, does anybody yeah. Yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Just tumbling out of out of course, out of out of control. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know where I'm going to land. I just find myself involved in this thing. I'm, I just got to follow it through because I'm already halfway in. I might as well just come keep going on. We find ourselves out of control, running on empty. <clears throat> Samson found himself there. It's interesting that when you look at the scriptures, that there were times. And I didn't take the time to pull this, but you can look it up for yourselves. There were times in his life that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he would do great things. But there were times that he would just do it on his own. You with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we know how to do it. We've got the power. I got a quote from my wife that I put in my sermon. Uh -oh. <laughs> Amen. This is a scary thought. Amen. It's interesting in ministry that we come across people, we come across situations. And we always hope for the best. I don't know about you. I like to see the best in people. I like to see the best in situations. Being a pastor, <clears throat> sometimes you see things that people don't see. But this is a quote that she says that I like. And I'm going to add a, a word or two to it. When people or situations show you what they are, believe them. Let me read it again, because some of you didn't get it. When people or situations show you what they are, believe them. You with me? Now, for us that are that are pessimists and for those us that are optimists, you know, the optimists have a hard time with this scripture or this thought. Because we always want to see the best in people. Whereas if you're a pessimist like I am at times, I would tell you I told you so. Right? Uh, come on. I mean, none of you are like me, of course. I mean, none of you have ever done that. But sometimes that's our Achilles heel because... Instead of listening with discernment and seeing what we see, and as much as we want the best and we desire the best for the situation and for the person, sometimes we can't give it to them. And the longer they stick around and the longer the situation sticks around, the harder it is on you and those involved. Yeah. Come on. Is this too deep? No. When things are out of control, there's a reason for it. <coughs> and you can sit there and put your head in the sand and say, oh, it'll get better. But sometimes you got to take action. And when that happens, you're not always the favorite person. And that's a hard thing. And sometimes taking action in our own lives, it hurts. It hurts us. It hurts those around us. But God allows those things to come because they're meant to grow us. They're meant to teach us. God didn't bring us this far to cause us to crumble and cause us to fail. 
He brought us this far to bring us to victory. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be trial and tribulation and things in our lives that are going to happen. It just means we have to keep his kingdom and his ways at the forefront of our lives. And whenever chaos shows up at the door, we can't let it in any longer. We lock the door, double lock the door, and get the 12 gauge. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Number two. What time am I going to get out of here? I can preach for a couple hours. But what time am I going to be done? That way I know, because I've got a long way to go still. Okay, I'm going to go. <laughs> Samson found within his life that there was, number two, something missing. What was interesting is he didn't know he was missing it. Did you catch that? Something was missing, but he didn't know it was missing. Get this scripture. Judges 16, verses 20 through 22. It says this. And he said, the Philistines are upon us. Now this is Delilah. She's scheming and she's doing all of her stuff. She had the three a thing, the three examples of where she tied up Samson. And, and she would say, oh, they're upon us. And he would break the ropes. And this time he actually told her what was going on with his hair. And now that was a symbol of his strength. And she had it cut. This is where it's going. This is what this is about. She said, the, the Philistines are upon us, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. Does that sound like any of us? Yeah. I'll do it again. I'll go through it again. I'll let them walk over me again. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'll allow it to occur again. And it says that Samson had this idea, this mentality. He just understood that he could do it by himself because it wasn't by God's presence. It was by his own strength. Look at this. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. It says that the Philistines seized him. Get this. We're going to talk about this in just a bit. They gouged out, excuse me, his eyes and brought them down and brought him down to gaze up. And bound him with bronze shackles, and they and he ground at the mill in the prison. It says, but I love the scripture, but his hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. We'll get to that in just a bit. But the key to this verse is this, is that there was somewhere along the way that God left him. That the endowment of presence and the, the Holy Spirit that rested upon him and as well as many others in the Old Testament, that God withdrew himself and said, said Samson, I can't, I can't participate with this any longer. God loved him and God desired the best for him, much like all of us today. He loves us and he desires us to move forward. But the problem is somewhere along the way, we stopped looking to God for the strength and we found ourselves doing it our way. We found ourselves going through the motions. We were like clouds without rain. We had all the form of godliness, but there was no power in our lives. Somewhere along the way, we lost sight of the hope of salvation. We lost sight of a harvest that God had called us to, and we just found ourselves just kind of walking about, distracted in life, not knowing what really the next step was. We just knew that God was still for us in some way, and we were kind of moving in the right direction. Well. Something's missing. Samson got so filled up with himself, his own self-gain, his own self-pleasure, his own self-promotion. He found himself so filled up with himself that there wasn't any room for God. Right. Yeah. We get so busy. Some of us today, we work two jobs. We pastor a church. We have, we, we are, our, our husbands and our husbands are preaching, our wives are doing children's church, we're running, we're burning the candle at both ends, we're doing all of this stuff, and we're doing everything for the kingdom of God, but somewhere we're losing our strength, somewhere we're losing our passion, because we're just doing all of this stuff. Come on, preach it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we got to refocus. We've got to re so we, re 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 recenter ourselves. Samson had broken almost every part of his Nazarite vow. 
And again, it wasn't the, the Ten Commandments that God was requiring. What God was looking for is what David spoke about in Psalms 51. Yes. He, he, he spoke about the very idea. He said, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Yes. Mm -hmm. But restore unto you the joy of your salvation. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what God was looking for. He, he said, God's not looking for, for, for a, a goat or an ox to be sacrificed. He said, the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. What does that mean? It means God wants your heart. Yes. Yeah. Not just part of it, not just a piece of it, not just when it's comfortable. God wants all of your heart. Yeah. He wants you to surrender everything in your life to Him. We've got to stop just going around and doing things our way and showing up to church on Sunday and saying, Oh, I'll come and worship the Lord. But we live like the devil Monday through Saturday. We participate in things we shouldn't be participating in. We have lifestyles and relationships that are out of the Word of God. We should not be doing things are going on that we think nobody knows about, but God sees, and you will pay a price for it in your relationships and in your life. You won't like me when this sermon's done, but that's all right. I'm not here to honor you. I'm here to honor God. Come on. So much unbreaking. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Romans 10, if you got your notes there. Romans 10, I want to read this for you. Verses 1 through 4. We read this in our Bible study this last Wednesday. My wife and I have talked about it a few times. Tell me, pastors, that this sounds like people in your church. Brethren, my heart desires and prays to God for Israel is that you might be saved. Well, that, that sounds good, doesn't it? God wants us to be saved. He says, for I bear record, or I bear them record, that they have a zeal for God. Well, oh, I've seen them. Zeal for the Lord. Man, I had a guy in a church when I was growing up. His name was Brother Nottingham. He's not only with the Lord, so I can use his name. He probably don't even know where I'm at, so that's all right. <laughs> but man, God would get a hold of this guy. The pastor would touch him, and he'd start running aisles. Amen. Just running aisles. Yeah, Somewhere along the line. He got distracted, left his wife, and had an affair. Mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, he, this is the same guy running aisles. He got distracted. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying God's grace is sufficient and God can't forgive and God can't restore, but the, the pain and the hurt and the destruction that, that the devil does and those types of things, they dig deep and they touch and they touch generation upon generation. It goes far into the, 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 the scheme of what's going on. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a people that have a zeal to look at this, look at this, but not according to the knowledge. That knowledge is speaking of the word. It says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness mm -hmm. and going about to establish, look at this, their own righteousness, yeah. right. have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. right. What's that mean? That means that God will sometimes allow wolves in sheep's clothing to walk through the, to the front doors of your church. Oh, really? That means that some, sometimes talent and zeal, though it's there and it's present and it's powerful, and God we need it, if their hearts are not committed to God, you need to be very, very careful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Zeal isn't everything. And I'll take teachability every day. You know what people don't see? I'm laying it all out here anyway, so we'll just see where this goes. Is people don't see the hurt that pastors carry. They really don't. And I don't, I'm not up here, because I've got people in my church that are here. I'm not up here crying about it. I'm just up here because I know there are pastors out here that can understand it. And that, that many times we, we shake our heads, we <laughs> call out to God and we say, God, why? Why? And sometimes he just doesn't answer the way I want to hear it. Mm 
It said that Samson didn't recognize that God had left. Mm -hmm. God help us as a church, as a people, that we don't get to that place. Amen. And if we are, His grace is sufficient. Let me say this, you need to hear it. Your calling is unrepentable. Right. You with me? No matter where you're at, what you've gone through, no matter whether you feel like you can take another step, God has put you there on purpose. And somewhere along the way, you've been walk, walking under your own strength, and that's why you're so weak. And what it means is we have to submit back to God and let him become our strength. Uh, I'm going to hit number three, and I'm almost done, I promise. Real quick. Number three, the fruit of sin. Samson began to reap the fruit of his sin. Understand something that no matter what we do in our lives as Christians... No matter how many games we play with ourselves, with our family, <coughs> with our loved ones, with our church. No matter how much we go through the motions and we, we think, oh, we've been fooled. There's a price to pay. That's right. God loves you. Yes, he does. But that doesn't mean that the lifestyle that you're involved in won't come back to get you. That's right. Yeah. 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 It said that, and I've read the scripture, I'm not going to read it again, but they took him, they gouged out his eyes, they put him in shackles, and they put him in a grind, in a prison to grind. The fruit of sin does three things. It allows you to lose vision. As a pastor, that's deadly. Because if you have no vision, your church has no vision. If you have no vision, your family has no vision. It's interesting that that was one of the big things that they did to him. Was they took his ability to see. Yeah. And see, that's what the devil does. Is he tries to get us to become so, uh, so nearsighted that we can't see afar off what God is doing. The devil gets us to a place to where we don't see the, the miraculous moving in our lives or we don't have the faith to believe for the great things because all we see is the problem in front of us and the situation that's out of control that we can't fix and we don't know where to turn. We don't know who to call and we, 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 we want to move forward, but we just can't see how to move forward. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, it says where there's no vision, the people perish. And it also says in another translation, it says that where there's no vision, the people cast off restraints. Right. What does that mean? That means that where there's no vision, people will not stay within the borders of what you're trying to do. They'll do it their own way. After you lose vision, you become chained up. We used to sing the old song, chained up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. Does anyone know that song? Yes. Some of us have become chained up, tied up, tangled up in the devil. Come on. We've allowed pride and arrogance and self-promotion, anger, unforgiveness, and bitterness to quench our relationship. We've allowed the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. We've allowed impurity. We've allowed ourselves to, to restrain, not being restrained to the things of God. We are, we are out of control. Why? Because we've become chained up. <clears throat> they chained up Samson because his strength was gone. They wanted to show him that they were in control. Oh, do I want to go here? Do 
You know that people want to put their chains on you? Yeah. They want to put their rebellion on you. They want to bring their division on you. Yeah. In the world that we live in, the very instrument that the devil uses to bring and to wreak havoc into your life are usually nine times out of ten other people. Yeah. And I'm going to say this. There are some cases that people just don't recognize that's what they're doing. But in most cases, they do. And so, when I talk about chains, I don't know about you, I can find chains in my life pretty easy. I just can. Because you know what? I got this flesh that walks with me everywhere I go. You might say, oh no, Pastor, I'm a righteous person. Well, let somebody cut you off on the freeway. Let's just think about the words that hold from your mind. Well, how about this? Let somebody talk about your kids at church and downgrade them and do all those things. And let's see how happy you are. Right. And so, you know, in my life, I, I know that there are things in my life that are not perfect. And that's not an excuse. It's just a reality. And that I'm constantly having, the Bible says, as Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting a good fight of faith. And I've got to bring this body under subjection to the spirit. I'm constantly battling this thing. And I realize that I have the victory in Christ. But I've got to do what he said there in Romans. I've got to renew my mind. And I've got to cast down every vain imagination and everything that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So uh, what I'm saying is there's a constant battle that's going on within me so that the change of this world as, as, as subtle sometimes as they can be they try to sweep in and catch me unaware they show up in places I never thought they would they come in, in, in situations I never thought they would sometimes they look pretty good but the real realization is this is trying to chain you up and drag you down you see the weights of chains they slow you down they limit your abilities. They burden your mind. They burden your spirit. They make everything hard. And number three, under this little thought, <coughs> his life became a grind. Now, I don't know about you, but I've definitely had my moments where I thought, man, ministry is just not worth it. Well, Bishop, I can't believe you said that. Sometimes it becomes a grind. Oh, well, you're supposed to have the joy of the Lord. You probably walk on clouds every day too, don't you? <laughs> Sometimes life brings situations that you never expected. It brings hurt from things and people you never expected. And so you're constantly having to remind yourself, it's not by my might, it's not by my strength, it's by my spirit to save the Lord. Yeah. Almost done. I'll wrap these two points up and just give me ten minutes. Number four. Finding true strength. I love that the Bible doesn't just leave Samson in prison. Mm -hmm. I love that God gave him a second chance. Mm -hmm. Isn't that like our Lord, our Savior? Mm -hmm. I read this scripture. I'm just going to read the last part of it. Judges 16, 21, and 22. It says, His hair began to grow again. Amen. 
there. A Christian is never down and out. You might feel like you are, but you're never down and out. You know why? Because you have God walking inside of you, his presence. Yeah. You know why? Because he brings his kingdom to stand yeah. beside you. Amen. I mean, you don't see those nine foot angels, but they're there. Yes. You don't see the prayers that are going up for you, but they're going up. We're never down and out. We might feel like we are. We might feel like we can't take another step. It might hurt. It might be difficult. It might be hard. We might want to throw in the towel. But we've got to recognize that God will send us true strength if we'll look for it. Amen. If we'll take our eyes off of the problem, if we'll stop ridiculing and complaining. Come on, I know that's none of you guys. If we'll recognize that God truly does order our steps and he delights in our way, glory to God. If we'll recognize that he is for us and not against us. If we'll recognize that that problem you're having with that person in the pew, it's not them. It's a spiritual wickedness in high places. This has worked within the body of your church. Come on, we've got to recognize that there is truly a battle that we're facing as a church. That the devil himself is going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's coming as a roaring lion. He's trying to sift your life. But I've got good news for you this morning. That the true strength will show up. God himself will show up. The Bible says this, and I love this scripture. It says, those who fall upon the Lord or fall upon the stone shall be broken. But get this, if the stone falls on you, you will be crushed. What does that even mean? It's talking about there in Matthew 21, 44. It says, if you fall on this stone, it says you're going to be broken. But get this, if the stone falls on you, it says you will be crushed. Is talking about if we humble ourselves in the sight of God and we humble ourselves and fall to our face and we cry out to God and say, God, have mercy upon me. God, wash me and make me clean. God, take out all of the impurities and all of the unrighteousness. God, you know who I am. You know all that I've done. You see all that I've walked through. God, you've seen where my hands have touched and my eyes have seen. But God, have mercy upon me. God, pour down your blood and your grace upon me and wash me one more time. I'm falling upon the rock of ages that cornerstone that won't be broken. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm talking about our soon coming King. The one that shows up when everybody's given up. I'm talking about the one that makes things good when all things are bad. I'm talking about Jesus, our Lord and our King. Amen. We've got to fall on the rock. We've got to realize that our strength comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from anything or any person. It doesn't show up when the greatest uh, a tither walks in the room. It doesn't show up when all of a sudden everything seems like it's going right. It's recognizing that our strength is not in ourselves. It can only be found in God Himself. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says this. He says, but this I have against you, that you have abandoned the love you had for your first talking. This is the, the John speaking to the church there. He says, remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Look at this. Repent and do your first works or the works first again. He says, if not, I will remove your candlestick from out of its place. What's he talking about? He's talking about falling and repenting and calling out to God. Amen. Amen. I had some water around here. There it is. Paul, would you come to the piano? Somebody, I don't care. I need somebody at the piano. And you're going to come. Number five, last point. I know you had your doubts that I'd ever get here, but I did. <laughs> You have to seize the moment.
Mark Williams, our general overseer at the time, or he has been our general overseer, now he's the pastor of North Cleveland. He was our speaker. He just got out of Bible college. Tim Hill, which is our general overseer, he was our state youth director. I mean, what a do some. I mean, you can't, you can't get any deeper in the church of God than those two, right? We were at this youth camp in Arizona, Miracle Valley. Very interesting place. A man named A.A. A. Allen. And if you don't know who that is, he was a man that God used in a miraculous way to, to perform miracles, healings. He said, well, I don't believe in that stuff. Well, I'm just telling you what who he was. I believe God can use people like that, and I believe he was one of them. This was a camp that he had established. His tomb where he was buried was just not too far. We actually walked down to it and looked at it. But I remember at this youth camp, I went there looking for something. Didn't know what it was. Didn't know what it looked like. I was just a youth at the time. I, I was just a freshman in high school. And I remember we went to the service and it started on a Monday and it went through a Friday, I believe. And we went to the youth camp and man, the first night God's presence moved and it was poured out and God touched people. And I remember I was thinking, God, why can't you do that in me? God, why, why can't you touch my life? I believe I was a Christian at the time. I didn't quite understand completely who God was, but I loved God. I wanted to be a part of him. I wanted him to be a part of my life. And I remember the next night, uh, Mark Williams came up to me that Monday night, and he he said uh, he said um, he said, "Are you getting what you want to get out of the Lord?" I said, "Well, Mark, uh, I said I, I want God to do something more in my life." He said, "Well, just keep believing. God's going to do it for you." I remember the next night we were there, and we had a group from uh, West Coast Christian College. Some of you might know what that is, and we're at this this group that was there, they were singing and they were worshiping God. The name of the group was called For Him. Kevin Barkley, a good friend of mine, was, was the drummer of that. And I remember it seemed like that service was scripted just for me. It just seemed like from every song and every every speaker that was there that, that God knew that that's what I needed for that service. And I, I can remember that, that, man, I was in tears the whole way because I knew that God was doing something in my life. He was stirring the water. the altar call and I, I came right into the altar and I fell on my face and I, I cried out to God. I said, God, do something in my life. God, I, I commit myself to you. Use me for your kingdom. And it was that night, that place where God spoke to me. He said, you used to be dead in sin. He said, but I've risen you. He said, now go forth and preach my gospel. And I felt a hand touch me on the forehead in power and, and it just fell through me. The Spirit of God, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at that point. And God used me in such a miraculous way throughout the rest of that youth camp. Me and another guy, we would go throughout the services and I didn't know anything of what I was doing. I just knew that God was in the house and we would pray. I was just a youth. I would pray over people and they would fall out of the Spirit. God's presence was so strong and so fervent in my life as a young man. I didn't know anything. I didn't have a, a master's degree in divinity. I just knew that I needed him. I knew that I needed his presence in my life. I knew that I needed to be a vessel for him. I knew that there was something more than what I was seeing. My life was in shambles and somewhere he showed up. You've got to seize the moment. Judges 16, let me read this. I'm bringing this in for a landing, first landing. Amen. Judges, somebody understood that? <laughs> Come on. Call it a few closing so I can too, right? Judges 16, 28. It says, And Samson called unto the Lord, and he said, O Lord God, does this sound like you? Remember me. <coughs> yeah, God, it's me again. <laughs> yeah, I know you heard me a few times. Yeah, you, I know I've asked you to forgive me of this like 20 times, Lord, or maybe 50 times, or maybe 100 times. It's me again. I pray thee, strengthen me. 
I pray to thee only this once, oh God, that I may at once avenge the Philistines for my eyes. Look at this verse. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was bore, bore up one with the right hand and one with the other in the left hand. And Samson, he said, Lord, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with his might and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people that were there, therein so that the dead which he slew at his death was more than that which he had slew in his life. that you had great things in store for me, God. And I, I'm cutting it short because of all the things I've allowed my flesh to run rampant and things I should not have been a part of. But as he put his hands upon the pillars, he was saying, God, let me do it one more time. Water's in trouble tonight. And what God is saying is, I'm looking 